A low mechanical growl moves across a scarred Ukrainian tree line. The ground shudders under the weight of a modern armored vehicle. Dust drifts into the air. Above, drones circle methodically, scanning for shapes and heat signatures. Emerging through this haze is a silhouette that clearly does not belong to the old Soviet inventory, nor to the patchwork mix of donated vehicles Ukraine has relied on since 2022. It is something newer, designed from the outset for drone-filled, mine-saturated battlefields and high-threat environments. Today, we're taking a closer, in-depth look at the Lynx KF-41, an infantry fighting vehicle designed by Germany's Rhine Metal that Ukraine has selected for co-production and potential standardization as part of its long-term modernization plans. Ukrainian and German officials have outlined intentions to manufacture it inside Ukraine through a partnership framework subject to export permissions and final contracts. These plans are based on Rheinmetall's public announcements, statements by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, references to German-approved defense industrial cooperation made in 2024 and 2025. The Lynx KF-41 is not just another track vehicle added to an already crowded catalog. It represents a generation of design that many European defense analysts originally expected to see in widespread service closer to the 2030s. Developed by Rheinmetall and unveiled publicly in the late 2000s, the KF-41 weighs roughly 41 tons and is configured around a crew of three plus eight or nine dismounted soldiers, depending on layout. Everything about it is built around a guiding idea. The next major conflicts will not look like Iraq or Afghanistan, and not even like classic Cold War tank formations. Future battlefields are expected to be shaped by precision weapons, inexpensive drones, dense electronic warfare, and a level of surveillance that forces armored vehicles to survive multiple categories of threats at once. That's where the Lynx's turret, the Lance 2.0 system, becomes central. According to Rheinmetall's official specifications, it mounts a 35mm Wotan autocannon capable of firing programmable airburst rounds. That capability matters because modern opponents can use cover, ruins, and terrain in ways that defeat traditional direct-fire munitions. Airburst ammunition provides options to engage targets behind obstacles or in defilade. In some configurations, the turret can also carry Spike LR2 anti-tank guided missiles, giving the vehicle long-range, precise anti-armor firepower. This integration has been demonstrated and documented in public material from Rheinmetall and Raphael and analyzed in NATO testing environments. The turret is paired with thermal imaging, advanced fire control, and a digital open architecture backbone designed to accommodate new sensors and software over time. These features are reflected in Rheinmetall's technical data, NATO comparative evaluations, and testing conducted for prospective customers such as Hungary and Australia. Taken together, they mean that the Lynx is designed to detect threats earlier, process information faster, and engage more accurately than the Soviet-era infantry fighting vehicles Ukraine has historically depended on. So why is Ukraine so interested in it? Based on public statements from Ukrainian defense officials and MOD commentators in 2024 to 2025, the Lynx has been one of the platforms evaluated as Ukraine looks toward the next phase of its mechanized forces. Demonstration and test events involving Lynx vehicles have been reported, with Ukraine examining configurations similar to those in service or on order with other countries, including Hungary. While detailed internal trial reports have not been fully disclosed in open sources, Ukrainian and Rheinmetall representatives have both acknowledged that the vehicle is being considered within a broader modernization and co-production framework. The reasons often cited for this interest can be grouped into three broad themes, standardization, survivability, and future-proofing. For nearly two years after the full-scale invasion, Ukraine operated what many analysts have described as a patchwork fleet. BMP-1s and BMP-2s from Soviet stocks were used alongside American M113s, French AMX-10 RCS, Swedish CV-90s, British armored vehicles, and many others. Every donation helped, but every new platform added complexity. Different maintenance tools, separate training pathways, unique spare parts, and supply chains that were hard to harmonize. Moving toward a vehicle like the Lynx as a central or core IFV over time marks a shift from short-term improvisation to longer-term structural modernization. One primary vehicle family allows for more unified training, more consistent logistics, and a coherent approach to armor, weapons, and doctrine. Survivability is the next key factor. Ukraine 
Ukraine is widely described by military analysts as one of the most drone-saturated battlefields in modern history. FPV drones, loitering munitions like the Lancet, anti-tank guided missiles, and a dense mine threat combined to create a harsh environment for armored vehicles. Soviet-designed IFVs were not built with this threat profile in mind. In contrast, the Lynx is designed with modular armor packages, a hull shape, and structure aimed at improving mine protection, decoupled seating to reduce blast effects on occupants, 360-degree situational awareness through cameras and sensors, and compatibility with active protection systems such as Rheinmetall's own APS solutions. These features have been showcased in company demonstrations and evaluated by foreign militaries in structured testing, including Australian Land 400 Phase 3 trials. Then there is future-proofing. From its inception, the Lynx has been built around a digital core, with open architecture electronics designed to integrate new sensors, counter-drone systems, and electronic warfare tools. This is particularly relevant to Ukraine's situation, because the conflict is evolving rapidly. New drone tactics, electronic warfare techniques, and munition types appear on a regular basis. A vehicle that cannot adapt quickly risks becoming outdated within a few years. The Lynx is explicitly marketed and engineered as a platform that can be iteratively upgraded, rather than a closed, unchangeable design. But perhaps the most consequential aspect isn't just that Ukraine is evaluating the Lynx, it's that Ukraine and Rain Metal have agreed in principle to co-produce it. In 2024 and 2025, Rheinmetall and the Ukrainian government announced cooperation agreements aimed at establishing armored vehicle production inside Ukraine. Rheinmetall's leadership has stated in interviews that this cooperation includes plans for a factory capable of producing systems such as the Lynx KF-41, pending German export approvals, and detailed contracts. Ukrainian officials have referred to these facilities as part of their strategy to expand local defense manufacturing. Public comments by Rheinmetall have indicated a target of bringing such a plant to operational capability before the end of this decade, with some statements suggesting an aim for readiness before 2027. Those specific timelines and output levels remain subject to political, financial, and security conditions. If these plans proceed as outlined, the implications for Ukraine's long-term defense resilience are significant. Instead of relying solely on foreign stockpiles or awaiting slow, politically complex deliveries, Ukraine would be able, over time, to build, upgrade, and service a portion of its armored fleet domestically. This would introduce NATO-style production standards directly into Ukrainian industry and help shift the country from a posture of emergency procurement to one of sustained, planned rearmament. Analysts often note that initial production runs or early deliveries of a platform like the Lynx would likely be sufficient to equip at least one mechanized battalion, with additional formations added as funding, industrial capacity, and international logistics allow. It is important to emphasize that, as of late 2025, specific unit assignments and exact production volumes have not been formally published. These are projections based on typical force structure and what has been reported in industry and defense media. What is clear, however, is that this is more than a simple equipment purchase. It represents a strategic shift in how Ukraine intends to equip its ground forces over the medium to long term. So, what role is the Lynx expected to play on the battlefield? The fighting in Ukraine has underscored how demanding and dangerous urban combat can be for armored vehicles. Streets channel movement into predictable routes, buildings provide cover for anti-tank teams, and drones can observe or attack from above. Battles in cities and built-up areas have shown how limited older IFVs can be when confronted with this environment. The Lynx, with its increased protection levels and improved situational awareness, is designed to give crews and passengers a better chance of withstanding such threats and maneuvering under fire. As an infantry transport, its purpose is to move soldiers closer to the front line with a higher level of protection than legacy platforms and to support them with firepower once they dismount. Western militaries have long emphasized the need to reduce the likelihood of catastrophic vehicle losses from single hits, and the Lynx's design is consistent with that approach. When configured as an anti-armor platform, the Lynx can carry Spike LR-2 missiles, which, according to Raphael's published specifications and NATO evaluations, offer substantial engagement ranges and precision. In theory, this allows Lynx-equipped units to conduct long-range ambushes or overwatch missions against enemy armor, using terrain and sensor data to select engagements more carefully than older IFVs typically can. Drone threats remain a major challenge. No modern IFV can honestly be described as fully drone-proof, particularly in a scenario where inexpensive FPV drones are widely available and tactics evolve quickly. 
The Lynx's advantage lies instead in its sensor coverage, potential integration of active protection systems, and its digital foundation for adding counter drone tools. Compared to BMP designs that date back to the 1960s and 1980s, this represents a substantial step in how situational information can be gathered and acted upon. To understand why these changes matter, it's useful to compare the Lynx to some of the most common Russian IFVs still in use. The BMP-2, an older Soviet-era design, is widely assessed as having limited armor protection and dated sensor systems, making it vulnerable to modern anti-armor weapons and drones. The BMP-3 improved firepower and mobility, but still faces serious challenges from mines, top attack weapons, and loitering munitions. The T-15 Armada, on paper, approaches or exceeds Western IFVs in several respects, but open source information suggests that its production numbers and deployment remain very limited, with little confirmed operational use. Analysts in Ukraine and abroad often point out that Soviet and Russian IFV designs were heavily influenced by a doctrine that prioritized speed, offensive firepower, and mass deployment over maximum crew protection. The Lynx, by contrast, reflects a more recent design philosophy. Stay alive under a wider range of threats, share information effectively, and preserve trained personnel. This contrast is not just technical. It illustrates a broader difference between older Soviet-style concepts and contemporary NATO-influenced thinking about mechanized warfare. One of the less obvious but highly important strengths of the Lynx is its modularity. Unlike older vehicles that are built in fixed, single-role configurations, the Lynx is designed as a common chassis that can support a variety of mission modules. With the same base platform, armed forces can field reconnaissance variants, command and control vehicles, medical evacuation platforms, recovery and repair vehicles, fire support units, and short-range air defense systems. Described in detail in Rheinmetall's own materials and was highlighted during Australia's Land 400 Phase 3 competition for Ukraine, if implemented fully, it would mean that training, spare parts, and maintenance practices could be concentrated around one family of vehicles, even as those vehicles carry out different battlefield roles. Over time, this can simplify logistics, reduce costs, and give commanders more flexibility in tailoring forces to specific missions. Of course, adopting a next-generation system like the Lynx also comes with challenges, and it's important to acknowledge them clearly. First, the Lynx is significantly more expensive than older Soviet-era IFVs. While exact unit costs depend on configuration, production scale, and contractual terms, most public defense analyses place it firmly in the modern Western IFV cost bracket, typically several million dollars per vehicle. This reflects its level of technology and protection, but it also means that large fleets require serious investment. Second, training is essential. Ukrainian crews and maintenance personnel will need time and structured programs to become proficient in operating and supporting an advanced digital platform like the Lynx Ukrainian officials and Rheinmetall representatives have both mentioned training as a key part of their cooperation. Third, infrastructure must be built and sustained. Facilities for repair, component production, storage, and testing are necessary to keep such a fleet operational, and Ukraine is still in the process of building out this industrial and logistical backbone under challenging conditions. Finally, while the Lynx is designed to be compatible with active protection systems, not every vehicle will necessarily be equipped with APS from the outset. As of late 2025, open sources do not provide a definitive list of which specific APS packages, if any, will be fitted to Ukrainian-produced or supplied Lynx vehicles. It is more accurate to say that APS integration is an option within the design rather than a universally confirmed feature of every unit. These points are not criticisms of the vehicle itself, they are simply the practical realities that accompany the introduction of any sophisticated armored system. As of now, Ukraine is reported to be conducting or preparing for acceptance and evaluation activities with early Lynx units and related systems, generally away from frontline combat. Public statements from Ukrainian officials and Rheinmetall suggest that the goal is to ramp up local production over the coming years, with the possibility of Ukrainian-assembled Lynx vehicles entering service later this decade if everything proceeds according to plan. In the interim, it is expected, though not yet fully detailed in open sources, that foreign-built Lynx units could serve as a bridge, allowing crews to train and doctrines to be tested before domestic production reaches scale. When you zoom out from the technical details, the KF-41 represents something larger than a single platform. It symbolizes Ukraine's intent to move away from legacy Soviet structures toward a more interoperable, NATO-compatible force. It deepens industrial links between Germany and Ukraine. It supports the broader effort to digitize Ukraine's ground forces and align logistics, communications, and maintenance with Western standards. 
By anchoring part of this process in local manufacturing, it contributes to a long-term defense industrial strategy rather than a purely short-term wartime response. And it suggests that the era of Ukraine simply stitching together whatever vehicles arrive from abroad may eventually give way to a more coherent, planned fleet. In my own view, and I'm clearly labeling this as analysis, not a confirmed policy statement, the Lynx KF-41 could become one of the central building blocks of Ukraine's mechanized forces in the 2030s, if current plans and partnerships are sustained. Not just as a tool for immediate survival, but as part of how Ukraine defines the structure and identity of its post-war army. So here's the bigger picture, the one that goes beyond specifications, armor layouts, and individual contract announcements. The Lynx KF-41 is not simply a new armored vehicle appearing on training ranges and in planning documents. It reflects a military trying to modernize while under intense pressure, and a country working not to let its future be limited by the equipment it inherited. Every time a Lynx chassis is assembled or demonstrated in front of Ukrainian crews, it represents one more step away from a fleet dominated by designs from another era, and one more step toward a force that operates according to contemporary standards. The vehicle stands for a potential future in which Ukraine's ground forces rely less on a patchwork of donations and more on structured, predictable equipment lines. It points toward an army that can be standardized, that can plug more easily into NATO systems, and that can sustain a higher level of technical capability through domestic industry transformations of that scale do not happen quickly. But choosing a platform like the Lynx, setting up co-production, and integrating it into doctrine are parts of the process. It also signals a certain strategic intent. The partnership with Ryan Mittal and the emphasis on production inside Ukraine show that Kiev is looking beyond immediate frontline needs and toward rebuilding industrial capacity that can support its security over the long term. The goal is not only to repair what has been damaged, but to establish the ability to design, manufacture, and upgrade modern armor on Ukrainian soil. In a conflict environment increasingly shaped by drones striking from above, mines concealed below, and continuous electronic interference affecting everything from navigation to communications, older assumptions about armored warfare are being tested. The Lynx KF-41 is one of several vehicles designed with precisely this kind of environment in mind, an environment where information, networking, and rapid upgrades matter as much as raw armor thickness. That is why the KF-41 is drawing so much attention. It is not just an infantry fighting vehicle. It is a platform for a different way of organizing mechanized units, a framework for iterative technological improvement, and a potential foundation for an army preparing for threats that were mostly theoretical only a few decades ago. Perhaps most importantly, it sends a message to Ukrainian soldiers, to partners, and to observers around the world that Ukraine is actively pursuing modernization and long-term capability, not just short-term battlefield fixes. The precise scale and timing will depend on politics, resources, and the course of the war. But the direction is clear, toward a more modern, more integrated, and more self-reliant land force.